So I'm sorry, everyone. I'm sorry to the degree to which this show, this conversation has become kind of a current events fest. Back in the day, we used to talk a lot about abstract philosophy and ethics and metaphysics and epistemology and so on. And now it's just become a kind of current events vortex. I'm really, I'm sorry about that. I miss it as much as you do. It just feels like events are overtaking theory to the point where we need to engage more people in conversations about philosophy. And I don't know how to do that and maintain mere abstract approaches and uh, try to learn from the greats in philosophy and history and it didn't work out too well for Plato or Socrates or Aristotle to merely talk about abstractions during time of great political upheaval and um, I try not to well go into their uh, following their footsteps at least as far as their outcome Socrates of course murdered by the state um, Plato was sold into slavery and uh, Aristotle had to flee Athens saying that he would not allow it to sin against philosophy twice and uh, died of a stomach ailment on a little island. So uh, there are times where abstractions are valuable and there are times when more of a barbaric yawp trumpet call to action from the very mountaintops of the world is what is necessary to awake a sleepwalking civilization that seems to be sashaying towards a cliff. Okay, so that having been said... I do have a way, I think, of tying these two things together, the theoretical and the practical. And this is going to be the history of languicides. And um, there are two ways of surviving in the world. You either go out and gather resources through the hard labor of like farming or, or hunting or fishing or gathering twigs and berries and roots and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and that's hard work and that's uncertain work. Or what you do is you have uh, you wait for other people to do that and then take their stuff, right? That's There's only two ways. You've got to have resources to live. That is not a commandment of the market or um, of, of Darwin, but of nature itself, that we expend resources, we require calories and you have to get calories from nature and in most places in the world at least not around sort of the equator or the tropics uh, it's really hard work you know, it's long cold winters and you have to work hard to get your daily bread and so you're either going to go out and wrestle it from a non-compliant and often hostile natural environment or you're going to wait until the hunters come home and take their stuff so there are the makers those who create resources or um, capture resources, which is kind of the same thing. Fish is of no use to any human being in particular at the bottom of a lake, but sizzling uh, in a nice saucepan with some lemon butter, uh, it can do a body good. So there are the makers, those who make the resources. And there are the takers, those who obviously take the resources from those who's, who've made them. Now, the takers are divided into two categories. The first is the threaten to punch you in the head if you don't hand over 20 bucks. The muggers, the, 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 uh, the, um, the Genghis Khans, the sword and blade and, and, and warrior class throughout history, uh, the Vikings, the Saracens, you name it, right? Those are the sword takers, so it's the takers of the sword. And those are for people strong in body, but relatively weak in mind. If you're stronger than you are smart, then you will become a taker. Now, a taker has, uh, like a sword taker, has some courage because you can fight back. Uh, he can be strangled in his sleep. You know, there is a real challenge to the bat. Now, those who are strong of mind but weak of body, they tend to become what I call languicides, which is language parasites. And this is the fundamental scourge that we're facing at the moment. You know, people think that in Europe the fundamental scourge is uh, radical Islam and this sort of stuff. It's not. Right? Radical Islam is merely the mirror of radical collectivism known as the left, known as social justice warriors and political correctness and so on. The vicious fascism of the left uh, is creating in its mirror and inviting in as its mirror, as its opponent, the, um, uh, well, extreme theocracy of radical Islam and so on. So we have to deal with the actual problem, right? You, you don't try, uh, if uh, 
if a statue is blocking your light, um, you try and move the statue or you move yourself. You don't try and push the shadow. So we must deal with causes, not effects, if we are to be effective. So language parasites, what do they have to offer? Well, they can't use the sword because they're, you know, 98-pound uh, spindly-armed spider-legged weaklings. So what do they have to offer? Well, in the ancient world, basically up until about, you could argue, the 14th or 15th century, in the ancient world, life was an ugly, uncertain, dangerous business. Your crops might fail, uh, some illness may come and wipe out your sheep, there might be a volcano, there might be a tsunami, there might be an earthquake, there might, whatever, war. So people had anxiety. And the more intelligent you are in general, the more anxious you are because um, intelligence is what is developed when you need to be able to defer gratification. The only way to defer gratification reliably is to sprout intelligence, and the only way to survive in colder climates is to defer gratification. Don't eat your seed drop and so on. And so in ancient societies, there was a lot of uncertainty, and people felt a lot of anxiety. Hunters and farmers and gatherers felt a lot of anxiety. Are we going to make it through the winter? Is there going to be an early spring? Is there going to be a frost that, that kills my uh, crops? Uh, are our birds going to come and eat my crops? Like, a lot of anxiety. Life and death anxiety. Now, what do we pay for? We pay others, goods and services, to feel better. I mean, you will pay me with time in the hopes that you will gain some illumination from what it is that I'm saying. And I devote time both for the illumination and in the hopes that you will go to freedomainradio.com slash donate to help out this most important and essential philosophical conversation in the world. So you pay to feel better. If you're hungry, you'll pay for meals so that you'll get rid of the sensation of hunger and enjoy the meal. Thirsty, sex, whatever it is, right? It's the same thing all around. We'll pay generally to feel better. Or to avoid feeling worse, right? You buy an aspirin, you've got a headache, so you avoid feeling worse. So we pay to feel better or to avoid feeling worse. Now, there are negative stimuli on the body that are involuntary. You know, you stub your toe, ow, damn it, you know, you, whatever, you get a sunburn, those are sort of involuntary. Well, I guess sunburn's a little more voluntary, but you stub your toe um, and uh, just sort of involuntary. You step on a nail. Or whatever. And there are other sensations which are negative within the mind, like uh, anxiety, stress, depression, and so on, which are at least to some degree part of our thinking. Right, like you, you get a letter from your local tax collection agency, and you're like, <gasps> right, and you open it up, and you're feeling stressed and tense, and then it's like, hey, you've got a free refund, and like, woo, right. So that's different from stubbing your toe. It's not what you think about stubbing your toe; it just hurts. Whereas uh, anticipation of negatives uh, is uh, the worry, which keeps us alive, particularly as I said in cold climates. So we have these negative emotional states, which are to some degree to a large degree, the result of our thinking, right? So you, you think of somebody who's really worried about paying debts. They're in debt. They don't have enough money. They may have lost their job. And then they inherit a million dollars. Okay, well, they've gone from worry about being able to pay their debts to being able to pay their debts and uh, assuming they're not like, I don't know, Kanye West, they can now pay their debts and uh, maybe they can have some worry about the money in the future. It's a different kind of worry. And so we go to a doctor to help or to, to pay the doctor, or we pay the doctor through taxes or, or directly. We pay the doctor to make us feel better or at least prevent us from feeling worse, right? So you break your arm, you're in a great deal of pain. The doctor gives you medication, sets your bone, gives you a cast, and uh, so on. So that's, we go to a doctor to deal with external pain discomfort, or at least to avoid it getting worse. Who do we go to when we have a stress, anxiety, worry, and so on? Well, you know, the modern people we'd go to is a psychologist or, heaven forbid, a psychiatrist or something like that, uh, or a priest, or a priest. So, when you are worried, do you prefer the illusion of control or continuing to worry? That is a fundamental question that we have in life as, as human beings, 
as an, as animals with abstract reasoning and the capacity to feel stressed by things that can occur a long way in the future. Now, in the ancient world, your life and the life of your family depended upon good weather, not too many birds, and whatever, right? This caused you stress. Now you're settling in the fall, you've got your seed crop, and things, are, you know, until at least winter crops like turnips were developed uh, or, or were used in farming starting at the early Middle Ages, you kind of didn't have a huge amount to do in the winter, so you kind of worry a lot. Is it going to get too cold? Are we going to run out of wood? Uh, are we going to run out of food? And so maybe, just maybe, there's someone in your tribe who's got a really soothing manner. They can make you feel better. And they will say to you, listen, there's a God. And this God can guarantee you a short winter and a favorable spring and bountiful crops next summer. Now, if you believe that, then your anxiety is relieved. And will you pay that person to relieve your anxiety for the next couple of months? Sure. That's a reasonably decent service that that person is providing you. You can sleep better, you're not stressed, you're not worried. And so someone can come along and say, I am going to sell you relief from anxiety in return for money or, or obedience or whatever it is, right? And the same thing can be said for illness, right? Of course, illness was a huge problem. You know, once UTI could wipe out a man. And can the deity provide relief from the anxiety of getting ill? You know, we, we, before you had modern medicine, and I guess even now you still do, people would pray for loved ones to recover from an illness. Relief from anxiety, you will pay for, but there's a catch. There's a catch. Now, one of the catches is just that the rituals are going to multiply endlessly. Um, you know, like like government regulations, just pile up, you know, like paper to the sky and to the moon and back. Because let's say that your um, your wife is not getting pregnant and you're worried about it. So you go to the priest and the priest says, um, well, um, uh, what you have to do is, is rub rose petals on her belly and, uh, you know, have sex and then she will get pregnant. You go and you, hey, thanks, man. Here's a, here's a gold piece. So you go and you rub the rose petals on your wife's belly and you have sex, and but she doesn't get pregnant. He says, oh, the priest says, oh, sorry, uh, what I meant to say was rub rose petals uh, Thursday morning at 6 a.m. I do that. Okay, now, and it doesn't work. So, okay, now, rose petals Thursday, 6 o'clock in the morning uh, during a full moon. Uh, so you might have to wait for a bit. Uh, and also, have you done any bad things? Have you thought any bad thoughts? So they give you a kind of self-regimented 1984 internal autocrat style of thinking. Have you had any impure thoughts or bad thoughts? Have you performed these particular rituals? And these rituals keep multiplying to cover up the fact that the priest doesn't have any control over your wife's capacity to get pregnant unless the priest is more fertile and you're not and she's willing to bang him. But the priest has no effect on your crops. The priest has no effects on the weather. The priest has no effects on your health and illness and has no effects on your wife's um, fertility. So you have to keep multiplying random things that you're doing until, you know, you get good crops. People say, okay, well, let's just keep doing that. Or let's say that they rub the rose petals on your wife's belly and she gets pregnant right away. Ah, oh, good. Well, we'll do rose petals until the next thing, time it doesn't work, then you've got to keep adding. So there's all these additional layers, which is why theology tends to get about as complicated as the federal register or the tax code, but that's not the big catch. That's just sort of an unnatural effect of it. The big catch, my friends, is this. That when you accept the illusion of control, you forego the possibility of genuine control. Of genuine control. If you believe that certain rituals and prayers and the transfers of resources to the languicides, to the language parasites, if you believe that that makes your farming so much better, then you won't actually work to make your farming better. Right? That, that is the great challenge. 
Like if you are the um, the tribe that lives in the shadow of the giant volcano, and uh, you you maybe you're hemmed in by all these other tribes, it's like the worst place to live, but you, you are not strong of body. Uh, then of course you're going to have some priest who comes along and says, or emerges out of the tribe and says, uh, "Well, I can guarantee you that the only time." that the volcano will erupt as if the volcano god is angry, and so if you give me resources, I will make sure that the, you know, that the volcano god will not be angry and will not Pompeii you into, you know, ashen heaps of deadness. And, and so because you're trapped there, and you're anxious about the volcano, then you pay the priest, not because the priest actually controls the volcano, but what the priest does control is your level of anxiety. So if you believe that you're safe because you're giving resources to the priest who is ensuring that the volcano god will not sneeze and erupt lava on your head, then you live where you are, but you don't fight to change it. Whereas, of course, the anxiety that you feel about living in the shadow of the volcano is trying to prompt you to fight your way out and live in a better place. Live someplace better. We've got to Take a run and break through the ranks and get to some place that's not so terrible. So when you have anxiety, your body is saying something's not right, something needs to change, you've got to do something better. Your gut is telling you, do something better. And if you then run to have people diminish your anxiety, then you are controlling your anxiety by giving up your control over reality. That's the key. You do not change your circumstances if you can pay someone just to change your mind about your circumstances. And that is the great catch. And this is why throughout most of human history, there was so little progress, particularly in things like um, uh, engineering, consumer goods, services, capitalism, capital equipment, or almost no progress. If you sort of look at the line of sort of human incomes until sort of 17th, 18th, 19th century, it's just flatlined and then goes through the roof. What went on? What changed? Well, um, for, before we get to that, the first thing to understand, or sorry, second thing to understand, is that this group has adapted itself. These languicides have adapted themselves to provide you relief from anxiety, to make you feel better. Human beings are generally abused by nature, to anthropomorphize just a little bit. Human beings are abused by nature. We have high caloric requirements. Like I need like, depending if I'm working out or not, I need like three to 4,000 calories a day and stuff goes off pretty quickly. So it's, you know, we need a lot of resources and we can't eat grass. So nature makes it kind of difficult to survive as, uh, as a human being, I mean, it's difficult for all animals in general to survive, except those damn bunnies. But um, nature is pretty abusive to human beings, which creates that stress and anxiety, which is then assuaged by the languicides who take money in order to make you feel better for internally generated states like anxiety. They are the doctors of worry. And what they sell you is immediate relief, and what it costs you is any genuine solution to your problems, right? I mean, if you are, I had this woman um, on my show, a great woman, Erin Pitsy, and she she set up one of the first women's shelters, and she only got in trouble by trying to set up a man's shelter, but she had a women's shelter for abuse, and uh, the women would come there all black and blue and beaten up and so on, and then the men would follow them, and the men would bring the priests and the rabbis and so on, and the priests and the rabbis would try and convince the women that they were going against God's will and had to go back and be this human punching bag for their psychotic husbands and so on. And if you believe it's God's commandment that you go back, then you feel better in the moment because you're obeying God's commandment, but the problem is you never get out of that abusive relationship. And it's the same thing. Human beings, throughout most of our history, we have been in an abusive relationship with Mother Nature. Mother Nature is a sociopathic, murderous bitch who will kill you as soon as, uh, you know, here's a rainbow. Here's a tree falling on your head. (laughs) Oh, rainbows. Oh, the pretty lights are so lovely. And here comes the bear to rip off your (laughs) head. So we've been in an abusive relationship with Mother Nature for most of human history, and that abusive relationship is facilitated by the languicides who tell us that they can magically control nature and all we have to do is give them money, 
and we give them the money, which makes us feel better, which reduces our incentive to actually go out and control nature, to actually go out and figure out how to be more productive with the resources that we have. Right, in the same way that these women, Erin Pitsy was counseling, were in abusive relationships with their husbands, but the Languicides, the priests, the rabbis, all came by and told them to go back to their husbands and, right? So the Languicides talk us into staying in abusive relationships. You're beginning to see the pattern here. And we pay them because we're greedy for short-term solutions rather than doing the hard work to figure out long-term solutions, which may in fact be multi-generational. And politicians kind of do the same thing when we get to that in a sec. I appreciate your patience. They're important stuff to understand. Now, for a variety of reasons I've talked about before, the rule of the languicites, the language parasites, was broken around the time of the agricultural revolution. And people finally said, okay, this, this is not working. You know, we have spent 200,000 years giving money to priests to tell us about how great things are and how great things will be if we just... So we have spent 200,000 years or 150,000 years relieving our anxiety about being in this abusive relationship with starving and getting eaten by and, and infected and bacteria and illnesses and cancers from Mother Nature. We've been listening to these, these um, languicides for 150, 200,000 years, and we're kind of where we started, so we got to do something different. So what they did differently was they basically said, okay, look, God gave us reason and God wants us to use our reason. And they did. And they started to do basic things. Like there was this um, this bridle that went on horses, right? And they, they used it to pull, but it tightened around their neck when they pulled more. So the shoulder harness where the horses and the oxen could pull plows without choking to death. They invented that kind of stuff. There were winter crops, lots of things. And basically, it was amazing. They got five times the number of crops. They got 10 times the number of crops. In some places, 20 times the number of crops. Simply by no longer listening to the languicides, no longer buying short-term relief from anxiety, but instead saying, that is not solving our problems. What we need to do is work at long-term solutions and not this short-term anxiety management crap. The excess food gave rise to the uh, excess labor that could go into cities and start the Industrial Revolution, and then you start to see human life really take off. Now, the 19th century is a huge problem for the languicides because religion was falling away, because religion had basically been in charge of human well-being for 150,000 years, and it sucked at it. And along comes the, the, the Renaissance, uh, the Enlightenment, Roman law, uh, Aristotelian empiricism, all this great stuff came along, and... The rule of reason came along and blew the languicide's sorry record of predatory non-success right out of the water. Nothing is more destabilizing to a society than a new paradigm that comes along that vastly outstrips the old paradigm and proves just how god-awful the old paradigm was. So the priests had been promising paradise after death for the endless suffering and the veil of tears in life for hundred. 150, 200,000 years. I don't know when, when it started. I don't think anyone does. But they'd been promising heaven forever and taking all this money. And then along come some bastard capitalists and entrepreneurs and scientists and doctors with double-blind experiments and actual productivity. And lo and behold, everything that had been promised by the languicides was delivered by the entrepreneurs actually delivered by the entrepreneurs. Amazing. And the whole philosophy of the languicides, the whole give us resources, we'll control your anxiety, that's the best you can do. Gone. Now, evolutionarily speaking, you had a whole class of people who had adapted themselves to providing false, predatory, stifling comfort who relied upon the presence of mortal anxiety in the world. See where we're going? And this evolutionary niche of the languicides, well, you know, when a species faces a challenge, it doesn't just roll over and die. 
course not. <laughs> Human beings aren't like, well, I guess I've got a lighter and a, a whole bunch of wood, but I guess I'll just die of cold. No, just, you change your environment if your environment is threatening you. So, what did the Languisites do when human beings gained genuine control over their environment and were no longer in the abusive relationship with nature that had characterized most of human history? Well, they changed. A lot of them left the priesthood and moved into things like a communism and, and socialism. Now, communism and socialism which, you know, through Fabian socialism uh, and through the, the outright communist dictatorship, socialism and communism of the 20th century, evolved into sort of the modern leftist, politically correct social justice warrior verbal abuse of the modern world. So, when nature was no longer abusive... the languisites themselves became abusive. If you're worried about something outside of your control, I can sell you pretend solutions for money, but I'm not creating the anxiety. The anxiety is there. You might run out of food. There might be a saber-toothed tiger. You might get hit by an asteroid, whatever, right? The thunder might, the lightning might strike your hut. So the nature provides the stress, the danger, the fear. And I just exploit it by pretending to sell you a magic, invisible Mormon underwear shield to all of these nasty things. But when nature was no longer providing the stress to human beings, and the only thing the languisites can do is sell you relief from stress, well, what do they do? Very simply, what they do is they create or invent the stress that Mother Nature is no longer providing because you actually have some rational control over your environment. They don't just give up and roll over and say, well, I guess we'll go from being languicides and takers to productive makers. They don't want to do that because this is what they're adapted to. So, so instead of relieving people from a stress inflicted by Mother Nature, the languisites evolved into inflicting the verbal abuse to replace the physical abuse that Mother Nature used to inflict. The languisites now start inflicting the abuse and offer you relief from their verbal abuse, just as they offered you relief from nature's physical abuse. They offer you relief from their verbal abuse if you give them resources. You see, you see. So instead of, I'm going to give you relief from the fear that your crops might not last through the winter, now I'm going to not call you a racist or a sexist or a homophobe or an Islamophobe or whatever if you give me resources. The stress and the anxiety now that most people in the West feel is not from nature, but from the verbal abuse of this aggressive class of takers called the languicides. There was, of course, you know, a precursor to this in terms of the idea of you're born sinful, but if you give us resources, we will temporarily remove, remove that curse from you uh, just in case you die, then you go to heaven. Whatever. It's always temporary, right? Now, in the past, the languicides had a permanent business because nature was always quote, conspiring to destroy human beings. And they didn't usually include war in this. I've specifically left war out because protection against war was the province not of the languicides, but the other takers, the takers of the sword, the kings, the aristocrats, who would generally um, conscript the fighters that they needed in order to fight back against uh, other sword-based takers who would come into the neighborhood. So we're just, the, 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 the priests focused on nature. And basically, people pay money to stop feeling bad. And so, if I can convince you that you're a bad human being, but if you give money to me, you're a good human being, 
existentially, right? And and without you doing anything, right? It's not like you you come into my store and take a handful of candy and then I demand you have to give me money to feel better. This is basically a decent human being. So the linguists are now using the verbal abuse that they themselves generate to provide you a temporary relief from the stress and anxiety of being verbally abused in public. Sexist, racist, you, you get the idea, right? And they will sell you relief f- or protection from their own verbal abuse if you give them resources, if you give them tax money, if you give them um, sinecure, if you give them tenure as professors, if you give them affirmative action, if you give them, quote, equal pay for work of equal value. In other words, if you artificially subsidize the fact that women tend to work less than men and tend to take time off to have kids. God love them. I think it's wonderful. I like there being other bipeds on the planet. So if you give these people resources, they will not try to destroy your life with their verbal abuse. And in the past, if you gave them resources, they would put in a good word to the volcano god so that you could feel less stressed about living in the shadow of a volcano. They have themselves now created the anxiety that they used to sell relief from. They themselves are now the source of that anxiety, the source of that fear. And that, that process, that relationship, these people, these are who are destroying civilization and nothing else. And we all know this because we all Fear speaking the truth about particular issues for fear of these laser-eyed lunatics latching onto us, contacting employers, uh, publishing things, just coming in with this bunker buster of verbal abuse until you damn well comply. It's the equivalent of paying off the mafia so they don't burn down your store. It's paying off the left so they don't burn down your life. That is the weakness in the armor through which the arrow gets in. Now, the solution in the past, why we got the agricultural and the industrial revolution in the modern world of of plenty and of technology and of relative peace, is we said, look, I'm no longer going to pay someone for fake relief from genuine anxiety. I'm going to take that anxiety. I'm going to own it. I'm going to handle it. I'm going to manage it. I'm going to take the risk. And I am going to sort this stuff out without begging some guy in a funny hat for the temporary drug of anxiety relief, which only makes my state of anxiety perpetual. I won't do it anymore. And then they rolled up their sleeves and they figured out how to grow crops, how to keep more livestock alive and all of the good things that happened that laid the foundation for the wealth of the modern world. They said no to the cheap drug of anxiety avoidance, no to the parasitism of the languicides. They handled the anxiety and they solved the problems that beset them. And there's no other solution if we wish to retain freedom, if we wish to retain civilization, if we wish to continue to possess and potentially even expand upon all the treasures handed to us by those who came before us. We have to stand up against the languicides. We have to accept the fear or the anxiety that comes from verbal abuse and act anyway. There's an old story about some 19th century aristocrat and some Weasley, I think it was a newspaper or something, got a hold of his private love letters. And they said, uh, some, they blackmailed him, someone blackmailed him. And they said... Uh, Pay us this money, or we will publish these letters. 
And you know what he said? And what we must say. Publish and be damned. <laughs> <laughs>